What's up, Westwood? It's good to see you in this room online, Bush Lake, Wistanka. It's good to be a family together, right? I mean, we get to be to the church. It's a good thing, right? Uh, hey, before we start, can we do one more round of applause for all our readers? I mean, come on. Yeah. Hey, when, they're, when they've been reading during this parable series, my heart is softened. I hear the word differently. So thank you for your boldness, your leadership, and doing that. Um, my name is Ben Rosenbush. If we haven't met, I'm the other bald Ben. OK, so if you've heard him preach, I'm the other guy. I serve here as the creative pastor. And it's my delight to get to preach to you today. And I have an expectation. I have an expectation that God's going to speak to you. Not because of something I say, but because the Holy Spirit is here. Holy Spirit's in your house, dwelling within us. And God is going to lead us into transformation. Amen? Anybody with me? Okay, yeah, let's have that expectation rise within us. And specifically, we want to talk about expectation as it comes to prayer. I'm going to say these two questions and let them rest on your heart. What do I expect when I pray? And second, who do I expect to find when I pray? Who is God when I pray? Okay? Let those questions rest against your heart as we go through this message. We're diving into Luke 11. We heard a bit of it read earlier. And um, we are going to find that Jesus is teaching us how to pray and teaches us what to pray for sure, but even more so who to pray to and what to expect in that regard. So, Our sermon is entitled Prayerfulness. Do you have, do you pray with an attitude of expectation? Are you guys ready for this? All right, let's dive in together. Okay, so expectation. It's always good to begin at the starting point, right? So let's start with expectation. You're probably comfortable with this kind of definition. Expectation is the strong belief that something will happen or will be in the case be the case in the future. Now, I say you're probably comfortable with that because that's what I took from the dictionary, okay? So you're probably comfortable with that definition, but it's good to just remind ourselves what we're talking about. Expectation has to do with belief. Expectation has to do with faith. How we shape our hearts and our minds to expect a future outcome, okay? That's expectation. How do we come to prayer with that? Now, for some of us, Expectations are right on, sometimes way off. In the way off category, my son's a good example. He was four years old, right? And he had the expectation, a strong belief in a future outcome that he could breathe underwater in the bathtub. Okay, his expectation didn't pan out. He came up gasping for air. But when my dad has an expectation that I'll be an hour late to family dinner, Yes, right on. The money always, the expectation is met. (laughs) We come to prayer too with expectations. Sometimes we come to prayer with a low expectation, sometimes high expectation. I bet some of us in the room have a high expectation of prayer. Prayer is a part of your life. You are actively praying because you are pressing into the promise that God is who God says he'll be. Okay, I bet there's a lot in the room, online too. But some of us have a low expectation of prayer. Maybe we don't believe prayer is going to do much, okay? I'm just saying the elephant in the room. Maybe that's because uh, we have a low view of the possibilities that happen when we pray. So we don't pray often or we don't pray much at all. Hey, I've been there too. And I just want to say, not in a shame way, It's okay as part of your faith journey to have that experience. Sometimes we have a low expectation. I want to encourage us into an authenticity. Be honest with your heart. Find where you are today. Are you somebody with a low expectation or high expectation? Okay. And we're going to find that Jesus calls us to have a high expectation because of who God is. Now, just say, you know, in a, in a sensitive way, too, we might have experienced something that's really tough. We might have experienced uh, in a, a time where God didn't seem to be speaking to us or silent. And we stopped praying, right? You might be there. 
You might be in a place where you're not believing in God's ability or God's desire to intervene or God's care for us that he's going to do something when we pray and be there for us. I just want to say that that's okay to be right there and to encourage us and invite us as the Holy Spirit's here that maybe we can open to a new experience with God. Maybe we can open up and find that God is actually who he says he is, that God is the one who intervenes, that God is the one who answers prayer, that God is our deliverer. What if we had that expectation? Our prayer life is going to catch a flame. I would propose to you the difference maybe between when we have a low expectation of God in prayer and a high expectation of God in prayer is dependent on our vision of who God is, a revelation of who God is, okay? So I'm gonna encourage us to journey through Luke 11 and find out who God is. You guys ready? So we're gonna go to Luke 11, and we just heard the parable that's within that chapter read aloud for us. But before that, Jesus teaches us how to pray through the Lord's Prayer. Here's the scene. A disciple goes to Jesus and asks him, teach us to pray. Isn't that a beautiful, honest, open question? He just asks, teach us how to pray. That's something that we can do as well. Okay, there was something in Jesus's prayer life that was so alive that they wanted it, needed it. Okay, there was something that happened when, they, when Jesus prayed. It seemed like a God connection that they craved. It's interesting that the disciple didn't ask, Jesus, teach us how to raise the dead like he did around the corner, or Jesus, teach us how to break bread and feed thousands of people. Jesus, teach us to do that walk on the water thing because that was amazing. <laughs> he says, Jesus, teach us how to pray. There was something that happened when Jesus prayed. So let's look at what Jesus teaches them. He doesn't disappoint. He says, when you pray, say, Father, may your name be revered as holy. May your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us, and do not bring us into the time of trial. We're probably more familiar with the Lord's Prayer in Matthew, which we pray aloud together, and we're going to do that at the end of our time as well. But this is Luke's account, and it brings out some richness. You could spend a long time uh, on mining this, right? But we're just gonna spend a few moments, just look through this at a high level. What is Jesus teaching us? First, Jesus teaches us that prayer is relational. It's about a relationship. Father, prayer is about a posture and a spirit of worship. May your name be revered as holy. Prayer is about choosing God's will above our own, seeking God's plans above our own, right? May your kingdom come. Prayer is about lifting up our needs to God exactly as they are. Give us our daily bread. Not tomorrow's bread. The thing that we need right now, the thing I'm dealing with, give us daily bread. Prayer is about forgiveness and living in that rhythm of forgiveness where we forgive others. And it's about God's leading, about guiding, about his provision and salvation in our lives. Do not bring us into the time of trial. So if we bundled that together, here's just a quick view of what Jesus is teaching his disciples about prayer, that it's always relational. Our Father. It's always worshipful. Your name be holy. It's always practical. God, here's my need. I can bring my need exactly as it is to God. And it's always providential. I'm gonna trust in God that he's gonna be who he is and that he's gonna come through for me. This is what Jesus teaches them in a short moment through the Lord's prayer. Jesus doesn't only teach it in this moment too. Jesus practices it, and he practices it later in a, in a moment in scripture that I think is one of the most poignant and beautiful that we'll see later. We're gonna see Jesus model this prayer for us. So as he teaches them to pray, he doesn't give them necessarily a method, a what. He points to a person. He points to a who. OK? 
okay? And Alan Culpepper says it this way, and this is really helpful for us. The disciples ask Jesus to teach them to pray, but Jesus doesn't give the disciples magic words to say. Instead, Jesus teaches them about the nature of the one to whom they pray. So this is about the who. And I think what we're gonna find is that the who in this story, after Jesus teaches about the prayer, he tells us a story, a parable. And we find that God is our friend, and then later, God is our father. This is who we encounter on the other side of prayer. So let's remind ourselves the story that we heard earlier, the parable of the friend who comes at midnight. I'm going to read it for us again. Take it in. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door's already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need, okay? That's the story that Jesus teaches after the Lord's Prayer. Now, it's important to know, in the Jewish culture in the day, hospitality was a huge deal, all right? If somebody came to you and needed something, you were obligated to help them out. It was the universal code of ethics for that day. So here we got this friend who didn't have his own bread because he forgot to go get some at the market or something because somebody came to him and he doesn't have it. So he's just knocking on his friend's door trying to bum a loaf, right? <laughs> OK. It's like, help me out. I don't have what I need to help this other guy out. you know. And to paint the picture even further, what's happening inside the house? Families back in that day would sleep side by side like a bunch of stack of wood, okay? And scholars even believe it was like maybe on a wooden suspended plank often like this. So you got mom and dad and all the kids up here, and then you got all the animals underneath. You got the sheep, donkeys, whatever that is. That's a pretty cozy picture, right? And so this guy's knocking on the door and he's saying, I can't come help you because you're going to wake up a zoo, if I move, all this is going to wake up, right? So it's not just that he's lazy. It's that he's going to wake up something he doesn't want to wake up. Now, all the young parents in the room, God's mercy to you. <laughs> I have four and six, or my kiddos, but when they were super young and not sleeping, right, and those times where it's just like bouts of time go by, eternity, and they're not sleeping, but finally they get in your bed and they conk out, you been there? It's like, don't move a muscle. Even if they're like contorted like this, I'm like looking at Jackie like, don't move. <laughs> if someone were to start knocking on my door asking for some bread, get lost. <laughs> Do not wake this up. You have no idea. OK, so that's the scene we find. This friend is knocking, and he just doesn't care. Let's remind ourselves, verse 8. I tell you, even though he won't get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he's going to give up or get up and give you as much as you need. So shameless audacity. This guy is just going for it. Shameless audacity is like a word baby in the Greek of like perseverance. He's not going to quit. And boldness. He's loud about it. So this isn't some casual knock. It's like a boom, boom, boom. OK, so that is what's happening. That's the story that Jesus tells us. OK, so this is a parable, right? What is a parable? And why does Jesus tell this story? A parable certainly is a story that conveys a meaning, a message. But what's unique about a parable is that it often flips the script. Okay, it's sub subversive in times. It says, hey, you thought it was like this, but really, guess what? The kingdom of God is like this, okay? So is Jesus telling us that God is like a sleepy friend who's reluctant in bed and we got to pound our door, prayers into his door? I would suggest not. Okay? This parable is not one of comparison that God is like this friend, but rather a parable of contrast. Okay? And this should bring to mind 
this sense of how much more. We're going to say that throughout the sermon, so I'm going to invite you to say that with me, okay? How much more? Say it again. How much more? How much more is the friendship of God, okay? God comes to our aid. God, our friend, is running in our direction. We even sang this earlier in the song, Goodness of God. Do you know the Psalm 23? Probably know that one. The Lord is a good shepherd. At the end of that psalm, it says, surely your love and goodness will follow me all the days of my life. That word follow in the Hebrew comes from the root word radaf, which means chase, pursue. That's why that song sings, your goodness is running after me. Our God, our friend is running after us. We don't have to wake God up. God's not in bed. God is already by our side and ready for us. So in this picture of contrast, Jesus is telling us, we find in prayer, God, our friend, is not reluctant, but ready. We can come to our needs because God, or come to him with our needs because God is ready for us. We find that in the Holy Spirit, too. As we look to the New Testament, Jesus promises the Holy Spirit the helper. Did you know that helper word means right by your side? God, our friend, is right with us. Apostle Paul even talks about that we are temples of the Holy Spirit if you've received Jesus in your heart. God is not in bed. God is in us already, ready by our side, to answer our prayers. So what is your expectation for who God is when you pray? May it be shaped by this sense that God is our close and ready friend, ready to attend to our needs. Let that shape your expectation today. Jesus continues teaching from there. He says, ask, seek, knock, and your answer will come. He says, ask, seek, and knock. These, ver- these verbs that are the present imperative, meaning that they are now and ongoing, so it's like keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking, and that door's gonna open up. Not because you have to, because he's a friend that's lazy or reluctant, but it's a sense of abiding. Where are you going to when you need something? Keep on asking God. Keep on seeking God. Keep on knocking at God's door because he's already coming in your direction for you. Abide in that place. That's the spirit that Jesus had in his own prayer life. That's the expectation Jesus had of God, his friend. Jesus gives us another picture of contrast, okay? Let's check it out here in the scripture. He says this, Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Jesus is being funny here, by the way. Did you know that Jesus tells jokes? He does, you know? he kind of creates this funny contrast for us. I'm not going to ask the parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles in the room if you've ever been tempted to give a kid a snake, okay? You may have, you know, in in your weak moments, but I'm going to confess to veggie smuggling with my kids. So when I make spaghetti, I think this is sheer brilliance, by the way. I take the red marinara sauce, take a bunch of spinach, mix it up, and they eat the spaghetti not even knowing that I've just injected their little bodies with vitamins and minerals. <laughs> it's brilliant. The problem is color theory, red sauce, green leaves make this unappetizing brown sauce. And so it's this brown glaze over tan noodles, but it's healthy, okay? And you know sometimes they can complain, but they, they like it. I'm going to show you a video clip of another mom who's given her daughter Piper some homemade pasta. 
Check it out. How is it? Good. It looks so. It looks like you're enjoying yourself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It looks like you're enjoying. Okay. You okay? You. <laughs> I'm okay. Oh. <laughs> All right. Here's the deal. That's one of my favorite video clips, and I can't just watch it once. So we're gonna watch it one more time. Okay. What? It looks so. It looks like you're enjoying yourself. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, think you're enjoying. Hey, oh, you okay? You're... I'm okay. She's okay. She's okay. She's trying so hard not to hurt her mom's feelings. <laughs> Luckily, my kids don't have as strong of a reaction as Piper has. But hey, both Piper's mom and I, we want good things for our kids. You know, we're trying to do something good for them. So hey, Jesus is being funny in this passage, posing this thing like, hey, you're not going to give your kid a snake when they ask for something good. Even you guys, you know, who are struggling with evil in your heart, AKA not perfect humans. Even you want to do something good? Yeah, I'm giving something good to my family with the spaghetti, you know? Uh, and uh, how much more becomes the contrast? So even though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children? You guys are doing good. How much more? Say it with me. How much more? Say it one more time with belief. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? How much more? So who is this father that we encounter in the scriptures? What's the character of our God, our father? God, our father, runs after us. You remember the parable of the prodigal son? The prodigal son takes all his father's inheritance, squanders it, and just hopes as he's coming back, trying to turn his life around, maybe, just maybe, my father will receive me back, make me a servant in his house. His father runs down the road after him to embrace him with love. He doesn't give him a snake or a scorpion. He kills the fatted calf and has the biggest party for this guy. That's God, our father. How much more? How much more? And this is expansive the love of our Father extends for all creation. For God so loved the world. It's God's love that compels God our Father to redeem all of creation, including us, your life. This thing is huge. N.T. Wright says it really well in this way. The idea of God as Father goes right back to the time when Israel was in slavery and needed rescuing. Israel is my son, my firstborn declare God to Pharaoh through Moses and Aaron, so let my people go. From then on, to call God, uh, calling God his father was to invoke the God of the Exodus, the liberating God, the God whose kingdom was coming, bringing bread for the hungry, forgiveness for the sinner, deliverance from the powers of darkness. You hear the Lord's prayer in there? When we say, our Father who art in heaven, we're communicating with our Father who is our deliverer, our liberator, our savior because of his great love. God's love never leaves us where we are. Maybe you've heard that phrase. God, God's love finds us where we are and leads us from death into life. God is our devoted Father devoted to our salvation, devoted to our well-being, devoted to our deliverance. And so in the contrast that Jesus presents for us, God our Father is not deceptive, but devoted. Is this your expectation of God when you pray? That's the invitation. So Jesus, he brings us through this teaching on prayer and shows us two contrasting images and teaches us that God is our friend and God is our father. And later in the scriptures, Jesus doesn't just teach on prayer, he actually lives it out. 
in the Garden of Gethsemane. If you remember that moment, Jesus there is there in the garden sweating blood. This is an intense moment of prayer. And what does Jesus do? He lives out the Lord's prayer that he's taught his disciples. Jesus goes to his loving father. Prayer is relational. Jesus kneels. Prayer is worshipful. Jesus even asks for this cup of suffering to be removed. Prayer is practical. He's bringing his felt need in that moment to his father. Jesus asks for father's will to happen above his own. Prayer is always providential. Jesus is trusting in God's saving grace to sustain him in, in, for what he's about to endure. And here's what's radical about this picture. Jesus, whose prayer, his what, let this cup of suffering be removed, doesn't get answered right then. He holds on to the who his father is, the faithfulness of his father. And his prayer is answered as he's delivered in the empty tomb. Do you get that? Here, Jesus lives the Lord's prayer, and he, because his prayer is answered, all ours can be answered. We live on this side of the resurrection, this side of Easter, because of Jesus and how he said yes and postured himself before his Father and endured the cross and was raised to life again. We can have the expectation of faith when we pray that God can redeem us, that God can resurrect situations, that God can resurrect our life because of where he's been and what he's done. He lived prayer so that we can live prayer too. What's your expectation as you come? What's your expectation as you come before God to pray? May it be that we expect God, our friend, a close friend, a friend who's right by our side, even dwelling within us in the Holy Spirit, May we expect to find God our Father, a faithful Father who runs after us in love. May we find, because of what Jesus endured on the cross and because of his resurrection, we can find God, our Savior, on the other side of our prayer. The one who will deliver us, who will answer our need in his timing. The one who will, in fact, come through for us. This is who we can come to expect when we pray. I'm gonna invite us all to stand. And Bush Lake and West Tonka and online as well. And I'm gonna invite us all to open our hands like this. This is a posture we often do at Westwood, a posture of receiving from God, lifting prayer. And examine your heart right now. What is your need that you have before God? Can you be bold to bring it before him? He sees it. Keep on asking for him to speak into your life, to speak to that need. And let's focus on who it is that we might find as Jesus teaches us. So join me in prayer, and then we'll come to the table and the elements, and we'll also pray the Lord's Prayer together. So God, we come to you. We come to your table that you have fashioned for us. And God, we come to you as friends. And if we have an image of you as a friend that is distant or reluctant, God, would you, by your grace, shape our expectation anew by your spirit that we understand you as a friend who is by our side, who is ready for us. God, we come as your kids, as your children, And God, if we have an image of you as Father that is uncaring, unkind, distant, removed, heal us. And God, may you transform our expectation as we come that you are the Father who runs after us in love, that you are the Father who is faithful. And God, we come to you as Savior, Jesus, who died and rose again. 
We have power in prayer because of the power of your resurrection. And so God, may we come with that spirit of faith and that spirit of expectation. We love you. And God, we pray this prayer that you taught us to pray with every voice. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.